I think most of you know already that we are here to talk about the Jennifer Odom case. But before I do that, I've got to go back about 13 months before uh, Jennifer's case, before she was abducted. And in north central Pasco County, another young female who was getting off the bus, and she was in her mid to late teens, uh, she was getting off the school bus and was horribly attacked and sexually assaulted. Uh, brutally is, is an understatement. She actually had injuries to her uh, head and skull that were very significant, and she was left for dead. Fortunately, the victim survived, but her life was forever changed even to this day. She was a true victim, a good kid. She actually moved from out of state to an area of less crime. Uh, Dean's List, just a good all-around kid and suffered this very brutal attack, a true victim. And these are the most difficult and frustrating cases for law enforcement because these are individuals that are not engaging in a high-risk lifestyle and are victimized. Fortunately, in that particular case, law enforcement was able to get some biological material and of course, Pasco Sheriff's Office at the time placed that into evidence. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. <clears throat> 13 months later, almost to the day, on February 19th, 1993, most of you know that Jennifer Odom in North uh, Eastern Pasco County was getting off her school bus. She was a little bit younger. She was only 12 years old. Again, another young person that we've come to know uh, through this tragedy as being a water skier and just a good all around kid. Everybody just loved her to death and she was abducted. Of course, Pasco Sheriff's Office at the time uh, started a massive manhunt and every agency in the Tampa Bay area was looking for the blue truck that was seen in the area by some of her classmates. I think every one of us and especially those in law enforcement can look at Jennifer as our our sister, our niece, our granddaughter, uh, and realize that, man, that, that is a tragedy beyond tragedies. Um, as we said, other students in the truck saw, uh, or other students rather, in the school bus saw a blue truck, and that was kind of the focus of the investigation over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so, because it was believed that that driver of that truck may have been involved in the abduction. Um, Six days later, on February 25th, the unthinkable happened. Jennifer's body was found here in Hernando County off of Powell Road. She, too, was brutally attacked and brutally, this case, this time murdered. And she was out in that field for some time. We're not exactly sure uh, how long her abductor kept her captive or when exactly the murder took place, but we, uh, a relatively confident the murder took place in that field, obviously sometime prior to her being found. Over the next 30 years, Hernando County Sheriff's Office uh, detectives investigated Jennifer's murder. Every viable lead, including those that came from Pasco Sheriff's Office and or the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or every citizen from people that had some information to people that were uh, totally off base on this investigation, but they were all tracked down and uh, investigated thoroughly. <clears throat> Even some of, the case, some of the leads over the last few years were revisited just to make sure that the detectives didn't miss anything. I can tell you that the investigation never stopped. In fact, Detective Logan will tell you that on Friday afternoons when I was in the county and wasn't dealing with any uh, difficult situation at the time from an administrative perspective, I would go back to his office and if my assistant was looking for me, she could usually find me back there talking to George about this or other cold cases. And this was usually uh, the top of our discussion about what we'd done, what we could do, what we hope to do in the future on this particular case. Dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of items were tested and retested every time a new technology came out, thinking that that little glimmer of hope that we might be able to get that smoking gun based on that particular test that was done. Hundreds and hundreds, and actually, if we dug into it, we'd probably find thousands of leads over the 30 years 
were thoroughly investigated. And to give you a little bit of perspective how much work was done, in the last 10 years or so, NCMEC came in, was about 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, give or take, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reached out to us and said, we want to help. And one of the programs we have is we go into communities and we take these really old cases and we digitally scan every piece of paper so that you have it archived and readily accessible. And of course, we were thrilled to death that they would be willing to do that. I don't know if they realized at the time what they were getting into because the people who came, and they had several people who came and did the scanning, they said it was by far the biggest case that they had ever scanned at that time. And I don't know if the record's been beaten. Over 75,000 pieces of paper. And to put that in perspective, think of the biggest book you ever read. It is probably a few hundred pages, and this was 75,000 pieces of paper. Prior to February of 2015 sometime, that biological evidence in Pasco County was tested, and they got a full DNA profile. But that's only half the story. Once you have that profile, you have to have someone to match it to. So it was run through CODIS, which is the National DNA Database. And unfortunately, up until 2015, they had no leads on that particular DNA. But FDLE, we got to really send a big thank you to them. They were looking through some of their cases, apparently, and found this full profile of DNA and did something that's relatively new, and that is compare that DNA to local DNA and see if they get any hits as far as close matches, meaning somebody who may be a family member. And fortunately, they did identify a family member who happened to be the son of what turned out to be our suspect. So in February of 2015, Detective George Loegren was contacted by then-detective, now Sergeant David Boyer, off to our side here from the Pasco Sheriff's Office. And they talked often, cold case detectives throughout the country, but certainly in geographical areas, talk and brainstorm frequently. And he let Detective Loegren know that they had a very solid lead in that original case where the person was found alive. They were able to narrow it down to Jeffrey Norman Crum. Many of you may recognize that name from the case in Pasco. His date of birth is 8-18-1961. The MOs in both cases were almost identical, with the exception of Jennifer, as we know, was abducted and found six days later. So he quickly, quickly, almost instantaneously, became our number one suspect in the Jennifer Odom case. Detective Loegren, with assistance from our cold case volunteers, and we have a handful of volunteers that come in and work several hours a week, they started an intensive, because heretofore, I will tell you that we followed, we had many suspects in the Jennifer Odom case over the years, but just none of them panned out. And Jeffrey Crum was not one of the suspects that we had listed, so it really kind of came out of left field in 2015. But I can tell you at that point, Detective Loegren started an intensive investigation that took several years. I think he interviewed every single person that he could find, and that was dozens and dozens and dozens, that might have known or been even loosely associated with Crum before, during, or after the abduction of Jennifer Odom. After a lengthy investigation, those facts that he gathered during the investigation were turned over to our state attorney, and we started collaborating with them. We work very closely with them because we want to give them a case that is not only good to make an arrest and make charges, but we want to give them a case that's prosecutable and winnable. And so we continued to work with them on a very regular basis, doing anything they could think of that would help bolster that case. And you have to keep in mind that both agencies have those hot cases that are coming in, and they have to be worked. And the state attorney is no different. If they have a murder and it needs to be prosecuted, they can't put that on hold to do some of these things. So it was a lot of work by both sides. 